So I hope you got some notes when you came in. We got a couple of things we're going to take care of. One, uh, there's an offering envelope inside your worship guide. That's for your convenience if you need to give tonight. You can do that. Uh, we're going to pray for our offering, and then uh, Phil and Ethan will be passing those buckets by. If you could just pass them all the way down, they'll collect them from you at the end. Uh, we'd appreciate that. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time to, to give to your kingdom, to your faithful uh, work, Lord. I pray, Father, that this would be a, a time of worship, and I pray, Lord, that those that are given tonight uh, would see themselves as advancing your work and your kingdom and what you're all about. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So they're going to pass those buckets by you. We've got a, a sign-in sheet in the back. I want to encourage you to go ahead and uh, sign in before you go if you didn't do that on your way in. There were some notes in the back, and today uh, I'm going to be leading you through this. We're in the middle of a, a three-week class. This is week two, uh, which is our, our share evangelism training class, which even if you know how to do this, it's always good to get a little refresher. And uh, I'm going to be going on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic on July 1st with a few other people from here at our Kenner campus and a few of our other campuses. And I know I could use a refresher course on this stuff from time to time, so I figured we all can. Amen? Amen. So when I was, um, I shared this uh, story not that long ago in uh, one of our other trainings, but I'll share it with you. When I was a, uh, a new Christian, I really didn't know what it meant to uh, lead somebody to the Lord. I didn't know, really know what that was. And um, I met this guy, and he was a street preacher, and he was telling this story on a, on a Friday night at this event I was at, and he was somebody I had made friends with and gotten to know. He was personable. It was a personal relationship. And he was telling me about how he had went that day to go pray with this lady at her house. And uh, she had some needs in her life and needed somebody to come pray for her, and they were doing some work around her house. And he said, well, I'm going to pray for you, but he said, before I pray for you, I just want to ask you, has there ever been a time in your life where you've asked Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of your life and you committed your life to him? And she said, well, well, no, I don't think there's ever been a time in my life where I've done that. And he said, so I asked her, well, what's keeping you from doing that right now in this moment? And she thought about it for a minute, and she thought, well, nothing's really keeping me from that mo doing that. And he said, well, if nothing's keeping you from doing that, why don't you pray with me today to commit your life to Christ? And and surrender to him. She said, okay. And I just remember thinking as a new Christian, is it really that easy? Is it really just that easy? You can just ask a person. And um, so the next night was a Saturday night, and we had church on Saturday night. And uh, at the time, our Saturday night service was, was even smaller than this group of people. It wasn't a whole lot of people in our Saturday night service we had. And um, there was this girl that I knew, and she brought her boyfriend that night, and he was the most arrogant person I'd ever met in my entire life. And uh, to explain to you how arrogant he was, he, he went to John Curtis, and he was on the John Curtis football team, and I knew this. And uh, she had told me about him before, and so when I met him, I said, hey, how you doing? I shook his hand, and he had this giant ring, like, you know, like this championship ring. And I said, oh, is that for winning the state championship in football? And he said, no. That's for baseball. This one's for football. And he put it in my face. And I remember thinking, I really feel like uppercutting this guy right in the face right now, but it probably wouldn't be a good testimony in church. And so I, I held back and didn't do that. But at the whole time, I was just like, man, what an arrogant, arrogant guy. I mean, how arrogant do you have to be to make a statement like that? And so the service went on, and Worship was going on, and the preaching was happening, and it got down to the end of the service, and it was the altar call time, and they stood everybody up for the altar call, you know, and when we stood up, I felt like the Lord was telling me, you need to tap him on the shoulder and ask him if he's ever received Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and if he says no, then you need to ask him, well, what's keeping you from doing that right now? And I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> First off, I don't even want him to be saved. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But <clears throat> So I, um, I wrestled with the Lord, and I didn't want to do it. And I just was like, nah, nah, I'm not going to. That's probably not the Lord. But, you know, if you get something speaks to you and says, lead that person to the Lord, it's not the devil. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's probably the Lord. And so uh, I just was wrestling. And the more I wrestled with it, the longer the altar call went. 
And like the pastor, like, there was like a church of like, it was like 60 people. There was like nobody coming front. And the pastor kept going, I just feel like the Lord wants us to just keep staying in this moment of prayer and worship. And I felt like God then said to me, I got all night. <laughs> and so, so I, I finally relented to the Lord. And I tapped him on the shoulder. And I was so nervous. And I was so scared. And I said, man, I don't, I don't know why, but I feel like the Lord's leading me to ask you, has there ever been a time in your life where you've asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life? And he said, he said, no, I haven't. I said, well, what's keeping you from doing that right now? And he was like, nothing. And I said, well, do you want to pray with me to commit your life to Jesus? And he said, yeah, I do. And so he started praying with me, and like he started crying on my shoulder, like bawling, crying. Like when he came off, it was snot. Like my shirt was ruined, like I need a new polo. And it was just... I felt like the Lord just saying, like, man, when I, when I tell you to do something, you need to do something. And that just embarked me on this journey of, because I can tell you, there's no greater moment as a Christian than leading somebody else to the Lord. Amen. I can tell you the reason a lot of Christians struggle in their relationship with God is because they never lead a person to the Lord, ever. They think it's the pastor's job or the church's job, but the reality is this is our responsibility. Look at, look at your notes. Look at some verses. Acts 13, 47, the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. Mark 16, 15, then Jesus told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Romans 1, 16, I'm not going to be ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and the Gentile also. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith, and as the Scriptures say, it is through faith a righteous person has life. Now, this is not talking about physical life. This is eternal life, Amen. everlasting life. Romans 10, 13 through 15, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But, circle that word but in your notes, circle it. But. How can they call on him to save him unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That's why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. the good news. The good news. Now here's the good thing. Think about it like this. What does it take to be a paper boy or a paper girl? What does it take? What are the qualifications to deliver the paper? Spike. Really, all you got to be is available. The reason, you know, like, we don't have this anymore. I know it's adults, but you know, back in the day, paper boy would be like 11 years old, 12 years old. That's why I was called a paper boy, yeah. Yeah, and then grown folks that needed a job took the little kid's job. That's what happened if you want to know what happened. But the reality is, there's very little requirements to deliver the news. Now, to write the news or to print the news, that's a different thing. But all we're talking about is deliver. You don't have to write the news. The news has already been written. You don't have to be the news. The news has already been lived. The choices have already been made. The decisions have already happened. It's been written. It's been printed. All you got to do is deliver it. Now, to understand this, you need to understand that Christianity is primarily focused on eternity and not that which is temporary. Do you understand that? God's primary objective is not to give you a good life on earth. God's chief motivation is not to make sure the air condition is low enough or that you get a promotion or that you don't have to worry about your car breaking down. That's not God's chief motivation. The kingdom of God, Christianity, the work of Christ. Jesus did not die on the cross so you could have a Lexus. Jesus died on the cross so that you could have 
eternal life. That's the pro- now, does God give you blessings in life? Yes. Does he want you to have an abundant life and promise it? Yes, he does. But is that the primary focus? No. No, it is not. It's one of the big problems I have with what's commonly called the prosperity gospel because it tends to be more focused on that which is temporary than that which is eternal. I'm okay with temporary blessings in your life, but that shouldn't be your chief focus. 1 John 2, 24-25, You must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you'll remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father, and in this fellowship we enjoy the eternal eternal life that He has promised. John 3, 16, This is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him would not perish but have. That's why God sent Jesus, was to give you eternal life. God blessed people in the Old Testament. Amen. Did God bless Solomon? Yes. Yeah, Solomon was incredibly wealthy. Did God bless David? Yes. yes. Did God need to send Jesus in order to bless you in this temporary world? No. He already had that. He needed to send Jesus so that you could have what? Eternal life. Eternal life. 1 John five 13, I've written this to you who believe in the name of our Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal, eternal life. life. Now, the reality is when the scripture talks, oftentimes, it talks about the fact that that which is temporary is to be endured. And that which is eternal is to be inherited. Now, why do I say endured? Because you have to understand that life at times is hard. Now, think about this. What's one of the hardest things you can go through in life? Loss of a loved one, right up there, right? Could you imagine? You know, I was thinking about this. The, the man that set me and Dana up was a pastor at Celebration Church. His name was John Guerra. He passed away when he was 40 years old of leukemia. He found out he had leukemia on a Tuesday and passed away by Friday. Okay? His wife was 38 years old. And I was thinking about this because me and Dana are getting close to 38. And I was just thinking, man, I can't believe we're the age he was when he passed away. I was just thinking about that. I was, I was, now, I was thinking about this, right? If the hardest thing in the world is the loss of a loved one, what must a person do in order not to be saved, but to truly experience eternal life? What do you have to do? you got to die. Now, you think about that. The only way for you to get eternal life is for you to die. But the hardest thing we can think about going through is watching somebody close to us die. Because that which is temporary is to be endured. No matter how much money you make, no matter how good or comfortable your life becomes, you are still going to have to endure this temporary life. Your body is temporary, so you'll have to endure your body. Because the older you get, the more painful it becomes. Amen? Amen. And so you have to endure it, right? When you're young, this is the great tragedy of being young. A lot of times, when you're older, you have the means financially to enjoy life, but not the body to do it. And when you're young, you don't have the means to do it, but you got the body to enjoy it. The reality is that in life, you will have to endure certain things. And it's not just that the body falls apart when you get old. Sometimes it happens when you're young. The reality, though, is everything temporary is meant to be endured. Eternal life is meant to be inherited. Now, inheritance, you don't have to endure. I mean, have you ever had this thought? I mean, God, why wasn't I born to a family where I just inherited a lot of money? Wouldn't it just be so easy if you just inherit? Like, like what if like, you got a call tomorrow and it's like, hey, you got this uncle you never knew about. And he died and he didn't have any kids, so he left you $10 million. How many of you would have to endure that? No, you ain't got to endure that, do you? I mean, you can walk right through that thing, no problem, right? Where do I get the check? Right? See, inheritances 
you don't have to endure. Eternal life, you don't have to endure. Eternal life is full of joy and blessing, and that's the primary focus of the Christian faith. Now, because that's the primary focus, that has to shape how you deal with the people in your life. This is what happens. If every ministry opportunity you experience, you think about from temporary terms, you will miss what God really wants you to do. God does not want you to just make a temporary impact in somebody's life. He wants you to make a eternal. eternal impact. What good is it if you make their temporary life better, but they never inherit eternal life? You don't set them up for eternity in heaven. What good is that? No good at all, right? Now, to see this played out in Jesus' ministry... You simply look to a story in John chapter 3. This is where we get the phrase, you must be born again. Now let's say this phrase, born again, together on three. One, two, three. Born again. Now, sometimes people use the word saved. Have you been saved? It can be used interchangeably with the phrase, have you been born again? But I personally, in this Catholic culture of New Orleans, like to use the phrase, born again. And the reason for that is because one day I was sitting at a, a table for a, a membership lunch that we do here, and I was the table leader, and we went around the table, and I could just tell people were saying things that sounded religious, but I didn't think it was really clicking. So I just started asking them. I said, are you saved? Yes. Are you saved? Yes. Are you saved? Yes. Are you saved? Yes. Are you born again? No. Are you born again? No, I don't think I did that. Are you born again? And I just thought, you know, this is part of the problem. Yeah. We got a problem with terminology right? Because being saved is a passive thing. You don't really have to do anything, right? I was just standing there and I got saved. Being born again implies that some kind of a change took place. I got four kids. Do you know what a baby does as soon as it's born? Cries. Cries. Why? Why? Why are they crying? Because there's been a change, right? You took them out of this nice, comfortable, warm jacuzzi. You took them out the hot tub and you brought them into this cold, sterile, messed up world. Yes, exactly. And they know I'm in trouble now. But it's because it's change. It's taken, there's been a change. There's been a change. Birth creates change. And when you've been born again, there's been change in your life. In John 3, we see Jesus talking to a man named Nicodemus. <clears throat> it says he was a Jewish religious leader, that means Pharisee, who was, um, came to Jesus after dark one evening. He came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And Jesus replied, you're right. I'm amazing. No. He says, I'll tell you the truth. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, which is hilarious because he comes up and says, Jesus, you're so amazing. We love your miracles. And he says, Nicodemus, you're going to hell. He says, if you want to inherit the kingdom of God, you must be born again. What do you mean? Nicodemus explained. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? I mean, that's just wrong. And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can only reproduce human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, and just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Now here is what he's saying. He's saying the first time you were born, you were born of water. That was natural birth. But if you want to inherit the kingdom of God, if you want to have eternal life, you have to be born a second time, which is spiritual birth. Then what he explains to him is, if you want to understand spiritual birth, you have to understand this. You can't see when spiritual birth takes place, but you can see the effects of it. So he says it's like the wind, right? You can't actually see the wind. But if you see some leaves blowing across the ground, what do you say? Oh, look, there's the wind. No, no, that's the effects of the wind. And just like you can't see whether or not the Holy Spirit enters a person's life, you certainly should be able to see the effects of the Holy Spirit 
the change that comes from the Holy Spirit, the transformation that comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what's crazy. Nicodemus was a religious man. He was very religious. He, it tells us he was a Pharisee. Now, to understand this, in order to be a Pharisee, you had to understand something about the Pharisees. One, they went to church all the time. They always went to church. Number two, they taught the Bible. Number three, they read the Bible and studied it. They studied it, in fact, so much that in order to be a Pharisee, the test you had to pass is you had to stand up and quote the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, which nobody likes to read, Numbers and Deuteronomy from heart, from memory, by heart. They fasted twice a week. Twice a week, which is two times more than you. Because you live in southeast Louisiana. Well, you was probably talking about dinner at lunch. And they gave away about 25% of their income on average. Then just tithe, not 10%, 25%, sacrificial givers. Not only that, Nicodemus believed in God. He believed in God. And he believed in Jesus. Because he came to Jesus and he said, Hey, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you come from God. So he had all this going for him, all these good things, all these religious things, but Jesus told him, No, you got a problem. The problem is you've never been born again. And you must be born again. You cannot inherit eternal life unless you have been born again. Which leads me to the next thing. Many people have not been born again. How do we know this? Because the Bible tells us. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, probably Jesus' most famous sermon, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are a few who find it. Now, let me ask you this. What's more, many or few? How many are you going with many? Many is more than few, right? So Jesus is saying there's going to be more people headed for destruction than there are people headed for eternal life. And the reason for that is because people have not been born again. There hasn't been spiritual birth that took place. Now, in Matthew 7, Jesus goes on to say, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, we prophesied your name, we cast out demons in your name, we did many wonders in your name, and I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. So not only are there going to be few people versus the many, of the many, many of those are going to be people who thought they were Christians. I mean, they said, Jesus, we did this for you. He said, no, you didn't do it for me. You did it for you. It was all about your glory. You never made me the authority. You always remained as the authority and the boss and the king and the ruler of your life. You never put me on the throne. Now, the biggest problem when it comes to being born again is when you talk to a lot of people, they don't know when they were born again. You'll talk to people, I, this is, I'm telling y'all, this is... I remember this. Brand new Christian. I met this lady, and uh, she had a son. She had raised him at Celebration Church, in church, in the early years of our church. And when he was about 12, he kind of went his own way, listened to Nine Inch Nails, you know, real, like, dark music, real dark lifestyle, was an athe declared atheist. 
I don't believe in God. I don't want nothing to do with God. I'm not into God. I don't want no part of God. He's got a drug addiction. He ends up overdosing and dying on drugs. And I remember her saying to me, I'm so glad when he was eight years old, he answered the altar call at church and got saved because I know he has eternal life in heaven. And I just remember thinking, I don't know, some things don't sit well with me about that. Like, is being saved, you praying a prayer, and then nothing ever changing? That was just hard. I, I, I really, and I struggled with this. And then I would talk to people, because I didn't grow up in church. And I would talk to people, and I would, you know, you'd ask them, well, when did you get saved? And they said, well, I think I got saved on like a, you know, like a vacation Bible school when I was a kid, and I got baptized. But then I, I really got saved when I was at, like, on a youth mission trip when I was 16. But then I really didn't walk with the Lord. I really didn't commit my life to the Lord until I was 28. So one of them times I got saved. I'm not really sure. You ever hear anything like that? In my own life. When I was 16, I went to a, a play at my aunt's church. It was uh, First Assembly of God of Escatopa, Mississippi which is out in the country. It's where they don't say furniture, they say furniture. I'm serious. Furniture. And they had a play, and the play was called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. And I, I'd never been in a church like this. I grew up Catholic. I didn't know anything about a church like this. And they got to the end of this thing, and the play was about some people die and go to heaven, and some people go to hell. And they said... Who doesn't want to go to hell when you die? And I said, me. I don't want to go to hell when I die. And they said, all right, we'll pray this prayer. And so I prayed that prayer and I started going to church. Periodically here or there. But nothing changed in my life. Every time I would go to church and they would get to the end of the service and they would say, if you want to commit your life to Jesus, pray this prayer. I would pray it every time. Every week I prayed. I got saved every week. But I never surrendered my life to the Lord. And four years went by. And then in 1999, at a Promise Keepers convention in Memphis, Tennessee, I committed my life to the Lord. And I struggled with that because I thought, man, when did I get saved? Did I get saved when I was 16? Did I get saved when I was 20? Like, which one was it? I couldn't figure it out. And then I came across this Bible passage in Hosea 9:11. It says, as for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth. No pregnancy, no conception. I heard a sermon on this, and it just hit me. That's the problem. See, in order to be born physically, what has to come before that? Die. No, physically. No. Physically to be born, what has to come before the birth? <laughs> Ladies, what happens before you give birth to a child? Conception, conception and what else? Pregnancy, right? Has there ever been a child conceived and born at the same time? No. no. There's conception and then a nine-month period. Some call hell, others call pregnancy. <laughs> right? And then you get to the end of that, and that's when typically nine months birth happens. Right? Now, here's the reality. In the same way that physically there is conception and pregnancy and birth, spiritually there is conception, pregnancy, and birth. Now, what is pregnancy? Pregnancy is the period of growth before birth happens. You understand that? So what happens for people is there's a time in their life where a seed gets planted and conception takes place. They become aware of spiritual things. Then they begin to grow some, but during that process, they're still miserable. And that's why you hear people's testimony say, well, you know, I got saved when I was 12, but then I never followed the Lord, and I was living my life, and I was just miserable, and then I committed my life to Him. Pregnancy is not fun. 
My wife, she tried to strategically make her pregnancies so she was never pregnant during the summer. But three out of our four pregnancies were unplanned. So the strategy didn't work too good. Now, here's the reality. For many people, they think that the spiritual time of conception was the time of spiritual birth, and that's why they get confused. But they've never been born again. How do you know when you've been born again? It's when the change in your life happens. If there's no change, there was no birth. Period. The end of story. See, the problem is a lot of pastors and churches, we've narrowed this down to all you need to do is believe. Now, here's the truth. I would say if you didn't commit your life to Jesus, you didn't really believe in the first place. True belief has commitment. But we've watered down belief to mean acknowledgement. Like if you just acknowledge, like is it enough to believe Jesus is the Son of God? No. Well, look, look at what the scriptures say. Many people believe but never commit. James 2.18 Someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God. Well, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Dead, dead meaning it is not alive. alive, meaning it has no birth. The reality is belief with commitment, belief with action, belief in faith. Faith is action, Amen. change, transformation. The old is gone and new has come. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preached to you, unless... You believed in vain, which means it's possible to believe in vain. You believed, but it wasn't the kind of belief that brought change and transformation. It was just acknowledgement, not commitment belief. Well, what about the person who backslides? I mean, can you get saved at eight and just backslide your way into 25? Well, that word backslide is a biblical word, just so you know. It comes from Jeremiah 14, 7. O oh Lord, through our iniquities testify against us. Do it for your name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. That's from the New King James Version. That's where the term backsliding comes from. Basically, it means over and over and over again, we keep doing the same things. But look at what he says in 1 John 2, 19. Talking about people who were in the church, but then left. It says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be manifest that none of them were ever a part of us. What's he saying? Well, the reason they left is because they were never really with us in the first place. There was never real spiritual birth. Now, remember the parable of the four soils? Think about that parable. It says, seed was planted. In the first soil, it never even got into the ground. Never even got in. Soils two and three, the seed was planted, growth started, but fruit was never bore. Birth never happened. In type two, it was because of persecution. And in type three, it was because of the pleasures of this world. Real birth... Real born again is what happens when a person genuinely commits their life to Jesus Christ, repents of their sin, and experiences change and transformation. Now, you might be asking, well, how can I know if I've been born again? If you've been a Christian for more than 10 minutes, you've had the thought, what if I'm not born again? Well, this is what it says in 1 John 5.13. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. So that you might know. So God's intention is for you to know. 
So for an analogy, let me say it like this. Let's say being born again is a lot like being married. Okay? Now, you might forget the date that you got married. Once. You might forget the date you got married. You might not know the day you were born again. You might not have a date in your mind. You might know a vicinity. You might know. Do you have to know the exact date? Well, think about it like this. Even if you don't remember the day you got married, you should probably still remember that you're married. <laughs> right? Like you don't wake up and go, man, I forgot I was married. Amen. Right? I mean, you know the around about time when another person moved in your house <laughs> and began to share everything with you. And that's the picture of salvation. It's the day that the Holy Spirit comes to move into your life, Amen. to live with you. Now, during the time of pregnancy, you can see the Holy Spirit. You can taste the Holy Spirit. You can touch the Holy Spirit even. Amen. But it's a whole different cry when the Holy Spirit comes to live in you comes to live in you. Not just live in you, but comes to live in you and is the authority of the house. The boss of the house. The leader of the house. Spiritual birth is like marriage. You don't have to know the exact date, but you should be fully aware that the event has happened. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why am I telling you all this? Because in your own life, first off, you should be able to say, I know I've been born again. Amen. Because Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot inherit eternal life. It is the biblical requirement for eternal life. And that's Jesus' primary purpose for dying on the cross for you. So that you would be able to inherit eternal life. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. Now, the reason... I'm setting all this up is because I want you to realize in every single person you encounter every day, the question you should have in your mind is, has this person been born again? People will say sometimes, you know, you know, I, I don't know whether or not my brother is saved. I don't know whether or not my, my cousin, my husband, my wife, my mother is saved. I don't know. Well, let's ask a different question. Have they been born again? Have they been transformed into a new person? Now, the truth is you can't see this in a small window of time. Transformation takes time. And the closer you are to somebody, the less likely you are to see the transformation. It's like, you ever haven't seen somebody in like six months and they lost 50, 60 pounds and you run into them and you would immediately see how different they look? Amen. Whereas if you're with that person every day, you don't notice the change as much. In the same way, it takes a little bit of time for us to see the results of transformation taking place. But at the end of the day, you got to just ask the question, have they been born again? That's why I tell people it's so important to take the step of baptism. Because baptism is the symbol of new birth. You go down into the water symbolizing that you have died. You come up out of the water symbolizing you have come alive, risen, been born. You're in water symbolizing the cleansing of your sin. You're associating yourself with Team Jesus. It is a radical step. When people say, I, I don't know, baptism, I, I, you know, it's just a big step. Yeah, it is. But it's nowhere near as big a step as becoming born again. The old person dying and a new person coming to life. Amen. To me, if you can't take the step of baptism, that concerns me. Yes. Whether or not there's really been birth that's taken place in your life. New birth, new birth. I have come alive in Christ. Now, the big issue is, how do you then lead somebody to the Lord? I'm going to make this real easy for you, okay? The first thing you have to do is ask them. You understand that? 
If you don't ask a person, have you ever been born again? I don't know what born again is. What is that? Well, let me explain it to you. Here's the Bible verses you need to know. First Bible verse. This is what you do. You get you a Bible that you're going to use, or you get your little notes in your phone, and you write these down. When I'm going to lead a person to the Lord, I let them read the Bible verses. I don't read them to them. I let them read them out loud. I don't want to convince them. I want them to convince themselves. Romans 3.23. Everybody has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. There's two parts of this verse. One, everybody has sin. Has anybody here ever told a lie? Show of hands. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying. So there's yours. And if you have just one sin, just one, that means the second part is true. You fall short of God's glorious standard because His standard is perfection. The only way to go to heaven without repentance for your sins and someone perfect taking your place is by being perfect. That's your only two options. Now, in Romans 6, 23, it tells us, now the wages of sin is death. So what we've earned for our sinning is death. That's what's due us. That is our rightful salary. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. How? By Romans 5, 8. God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You didn't have to meet a prerequisite. Jesus just died for you while you were still a sinner. So, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith you're saved. And that's why Romans 10, 13 says, So everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Key phrase, Lord. That means boss, king, ruler, authority, the one who's in charge. So to call upon him as Lord means that you step down as Lord of your life. You step off the throne and you give him the position of authority and leadership. And you say, you know what, from now on I'm going to do whatever you ask me to do, not what I want to do. Because I'm no longer in charge, I'm placing you in charge. And at this moment, once a person gets here, I say, so here's the question. Do you feel like God, Jesus, is knocking on the door of your heart? Do you feel like the Holy Spirit is convicting you? If they say, no, I don't, that's the end of the conversation. If they say, yes, I do, then you say, well, are you going to open it and let him in? This comes from Romans chapter 3. You can see in verse 20, look, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus speaking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. This is the choice. Jesus is not going to undo your heart. Are you going to let him in? Now, I believe that this Bible verse applies definitively to salvation, to being born again, to having eternal life. There are some biblical scholars who think that you can't apply this verse to salvation, but I'm going to tell you why I think you can. I'm teaching you. Because if you'll go up a few verses into verse 15, you'll realize this is the church in Laodicea, and Jesus is speaking to them, and he says, I know all the things you do, and that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other, but since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Does that sound like somebody who's in or out? Out. Out. He says, you say, I'm rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. Well, those are all markers of a person who is not in need of a Savior. I'm rich, I don't need anything. I got it covered. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So you have all kinds of needs, but you don't see any of them. Is blindness a sign of a person who's born again or a person who's lost? Is nakedness a sign of sinfulness? You remember Adam and Eve? What did they discover after they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? 
that they were naked. And then he says, I advise you to buy gold for me, to buy white garments for me, and to get ointment from your eyes. I can clothe you in righteous garments. I can give you the true wealth that you're missing. I can give you the ability to see. This is about salvation. Just because it was a church, it was just a church full of people saying, Lord, Lord, we prophesied your name, we cast out demons in your name. That's all it was. He said, no, you need to let me in. Now, here's what people do. Take Phil. I'm talking to Phil. Phil, Jesus is not going to endure your heart. Are you going to let him in? I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready for that. Now, you think about this. Why do people think they're not ready? Okay, let's say this happened. Let's say, I said, Sam and Lorena, y'all want to come over tonight after church? And they said, yes. And I went to my wife and said, Dana, Sam and Lorena go come over after church. What's the first thing Dana's going to say? The house ain't ready. It looks like a disaster went off, like a bomb went off. I'm going to go right now and try to get it ready. I'll kill you later. How many of you know this is happening, right? Now, this is what most people do. We say, ooh, I don't want to let Jesus in right now because it's a mess. So let me clean it up. And then once it gets ready, then I'll invite Jesus in. That's not how this works. See, you can take all your stuff and try to slide it under the bed and stuff it in the closet. You know, look, look, I promise you, me and Dana, before we moved out to Kenner, we had an 830-square-foot house in Harahan. Two bedrooms, one bath, 830 square feet. If you do the math, that's about 10 square feet per room. Okay? The laundry was a door like that, And when you opened it, it was just a closet with a stackable washer dryer in it, which meant there was no laundry room, right? So your dirty laundry was always in the kitchen. That's where it was. Clean clothes, dirty clothes, whatever. It was in the kitchen. And so when we went to sell our house, we had to try to make the house look like there wasn't laundry all over the place. So whenever somebody would come look at the house, we would take all the laundry and put it in the car. Go drive around with a car full of dirty laundry until the people left, and then we come back. All right? And that house sold, you hear me? Yeah, that house sold. And then the people live there for a week, they're like, where did these people put their laundry? In the car, baby, in the car. Now, here's the deal. That's what we try to do with Jesus. We try to hide our dirty laundry. It doesn't work like that. He knows you got laundry in the car. He knows what's under the mattress. He knows what's in the closet. He's not asking you to get it ready. He's just asking you to invite him in. So what's keeping you from inviting him into your heart? In Luke 9, Jesus said to the crowd, if anybody wants to be my follower, all they need to do is give up their own way. Take up their cross daily and follow me. Because if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? But you lose your soul in the process. What good is it if your temporary life is going great, but you don't have any eternal life? So what's keeping you today from surrendering your life to Jesus? And when they say nothing, you say, good, let's pray. (laughs) And this is how you pray with them. Bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to repeat after me. We're going to pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit I've fallen short. But I believe you came from heaven to die on a cross to take my place, to forgive me so that I could have eternal life in heaven. I commit my life to you today. I die to myself. I want to inherit your eternal kingdom. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And then what do you do from there? You live it as he is the Lord. 
Now, when someone is the Lord of your life, do you want to do what they want all the time? Amen. No. Okay. Anybody here been married before? Um, did you ever disagree with the other person about what you wanted to do or what should be done? Yeah, anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. So when, when you get married to the Lord, you say to him, okay, Lord, it's your way all the time. Which is the reason why you have marriage conflicts now. Because you don't tell the other person it's your way all the time. Because if you just did what they wanted all the time, there'd never be a fight. Or vice versa. But that's what it's supposed to be with the Lord. Lord, whatever you want. The Lord says you need to forgive that person. I don't want to forgive them. Did I ask you what you wanted? You need to overcome your anxiety. You need to trust in me. You need to, whatever it is then, it's by him being the Lord. I want you to go out of this place today really thinking the people in your life, have they been born again? Just try this. You work with somebody, ask them. Hey, man, you ever been born again? You know what they're going to say? What? what that means? Well, let me explain it to you. And you just pull these notes out. According to John chapter 3, <laughs> that's why I'm giving this stuff to you, all right? Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be in the Dominican Republic July 1st or the 8th, the people on the trip with me. Chantrell's going to be with me. Chantrell's going to see me do what I just did. And then she's going to do it. Amen. And she's going to lead somebody to the Lord, and then she's going to come back in just flying. Because <laughs> she's going to be so excited and so pumped up because she made an eternal impact in somebody's life and that's what this is all about got what i'm saying yeah. all right go and sin no more